Hey guys, welcome to the Smart Venture Podcast. In each episode, we're going to have conversations with some of the top investors, superstar founders, as well as well-known tech company executives in Silicon Valley. We'll have a coffee chat with them to learn their way of thinking and actionable tips on how they build or invest in a successful company. Before we start our show today, I want to make sure the listener, aka you, understand that everything a person say on the podcast only reflects hers or his own opinion, not the show or the company they work at. Our guest today is a partner at M13 Ventures, where he invests in consumer tech companies. M13's portfolio includes Pinterest, SpaceX, Snapchat, Lyft, just to name a few. Prior to M13, he was the founder and CEO of NatureBox, an early stage investor at General Catalyst. He invests in more than 30 companies, including Big Commerce, Honest Company, Grammarly, and many others. He is also on the board of overseers at Babson College. His name is Gautam Gupta. Welcome to the show, Gautam. Of course, it's my pleasure. Gautam, I feel like you're so impressive. I think when I met you a couple years ago, back in time, you were already my role model. You started NatureBox not long ago. You work at General Catalyst. You started your own company, and now you became a VC again. This is such amazing career track. You, you are far too kind,、uh, and and I can only disappoint the audience now.、Um, you know, but you're far too kind. I,、um, you know, have made so many countless mistakes. I'm sure we're going to talk about a lot of them.、Uh, but it's great to see your success and, and the path that you've been on.、Um, and yeah, can't wait to get into it. Thank you, Gautam. From my understanding, you always wanted to be an entrepreneur. You went to Babson for college, which is a very entrepreneurial school. Is there something happen early on your Career or life that shape you into who you are today. So I came from an immigrant family.、Uh, my both my dad and mom moved from India, and both grandfathers. So my grandfather on my father's side and and mother's side had been entrepreneurs in India. So a lot of the conversation at the dining table was about business, and whenever we would go back to India,、um, I would see. The family business, and go with my grandfather to the factory, or you know, to his office, and so that I'm sure had a pretty big influence on me、uh, growing up. I distinctly remember one experience, which is、uh, I vaguely remember this, but as you can probably relate, when your parents tell you a story a hundred times, you're, you think <laughs> you, maybe you remember more than you really do. But、um, I, I, my parents have kind of told me the story of when I was,、uh, I think, you know, five or six years old. We were in India, and、uh, it was quite commonplace in those days to do. Do business dealing with cash, so you'd have a lot of just、um, rupee notes,、uh, and you would transact、uh, in in large quantities of cash.、Uh, and so my grandfather was sitting at the table counting out stacks of of bills,、uh, and I went and sat there, started helping him count, and then after counting、uh, all of these bills, I said, "Where's my counter's fee?" And、he said, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, I'm not going to count this for free."、Uh, so that that's kind of when, at least for my parents, when they said, "Oh, this kid is going to be an entrepreneur. This kid's going to go into business." So,、uh, yeah, that that was kind of the story. Wow, you were so business savvy. That's great. What kind of business did they start? So both、uh, my grandfathers had been in a variety of different businesses, but. The common thread between both was steel,、uh, so they were in the steel industry in、uh, India,、uh, and then they had kind of other holdings and other businesses as well, but primarily steel. Nice. Have you traveled back to India recently? Oh yeah, oh yeah. We we were there.、Uh, my wife and I were there twice actually in November for family weddings. Uh, oh, nice. So the,、uh, those weddings were perfectly timed, three weeks apart. So we we made two separate trips and、uh, spent the rest of the month recovering from jet lag. Wow, that's so cool! I really admire the Indian fashion. The dresses are amazing. I feel like we're far away from the VC topic, but you always wanted to become an entrepreneur. You started your VC journey when you were eighteen at General Cutlass. Throughout the years, I assume you had many mentors. Who is on your personal board? Advisors when it comes to career decisions. Well, I've been very lucky in that I've had 
people, the people that I've worked with, whether it's General Catalyst, NatureBox, I've tried and, and mostly been successful in kind of keeping in touch and, you know, keeping a, a good relationship with a lot of the, the folks that I've worked with. And so I've been really lucky that uh, just over the years, uh, you know, the number of peers and mentors uh, has really only grown. Uh, and, and so, you know, whether it is kind of a, you know, two people, my two first uh, managers at General Catalyst, a guy named Isaac Cato, uh, and then Brad Hoover. Isaac runs Techstar Seattle. Brad is the CEO of Grammarly. So, I mean, they're just, they've been great mentors throughout my entire career. And they were the first two people, you know, that I ever worked for. Uh, so I, I've been super lucky, I think, uh, to call many folks uh, mentors and, and, uh, benefit from some of the kind of knowledge and, and the advice, uh, you know, that, that these folks have gained from having their own uh, tremendous journeys and, and been on uh, great paths. Yeah, absolutely. So they were all pretty much organic relationships after you guys working together. VC is such a network driven business. How do you expand your own network? And is there any secret on keeping in touch with folks you have encountered? Uh, I don't know that there's any secret or certainly if there is, I haven't learned it. Uh, but I'll tell you kind of the couple things that I always keep in mind when I'm thinking about whether it's networking or relationship building. I, I don't love the word networking because it <laughs> feels very uh, almost too deliberate. Uh, it sort of lacks some of the serendipity of life. Uh, <laughs> and I find that a lot of your best relationships kind of happen just serendipitously. Uh, but the two things I would say, one is to avoid being transactional. I think one of the challenges in an ecosystem that is fast paced, which I would say venture, the venture world today is incredibly fast paced. One of the challenges is, is not being transactional, right? And so when you call someone for uh, diligence on a company or you're asking for an introduction, how do you make those interactions uh, part of a longer thread of what becomes a relationship versus I'm just going to reach out to you whenever I need you. Uh, so, so one is just really thinking, being thoughtful about how do you avoid being transactional and how do you um, prioritize the wanting to really get to know the other person and building a relationship uh, where there's give and take. Uh, and the second one, I think kind of dovetails into that, which is I'm always thinking about what can I do for the people around me and, and the people that I know. And, and so I'm always trying to look for ways to give, give versus get. And, mm -hmm. and so I do think that if you're able to do that successfully, um, that is so tremendously valuable uh, in creating long long and healthy relationships but i just think prioritizing giving versus getting yeah speaking of that i really appreciate that you took the time to meet me a couple years ago back in time you were a successful founder you worked at vc i was pretty much in no way can bring you value and you decided to meet me after i reach out i'm super thankful for that uh, i'm also a big believer that the young people the young ambitious people that you meet throughout your career will be the people that you end up working for later oh, so I'm, I'm very much a believer that folks like you are, are going to run the world and, and maybe you'll be nice enough to give me a job someday. So, Oh my God, you're too humble and too kind. I feel like I just need to copy paste this part and listen to it every day to manifest. Also, exactly like what you said, I feel like sometimes you just need to be really open minded so some people can come into your life. A lot of it is just serendipity instead of manually forcing something to happen. Since you worked both as a founder and a VC, what would you say is one skill that you're constantly learning and trying to get better at? I think one skill that regardless of whether you're a VC or an entrepreneur is incredibly important and that you can always get better at is selling. Uh, it is pretty amazing when you talk to people about venture capital, it's pretty amazing to me that uh, folks, you know, what some of the visions uh, that people have of what a VC does. Mm -hmm. And the reality is most of the job is selling, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's getting in front of entrepreneurs who have 
multiple options and convincing them why they should work with you and why they should take your option. Uh, and so it is very much, I think, a sales job. It's no secret that some of the best VCs of all time have been salespeople, right? Uh, John Doerr, Don Valentine. Uh, so, so I think that's one I would say, and that extends into entrepreneurship as well, because even if, you, uh, if you're the founder CEO, you might think, well, I'm gonna hire a salesperson uh, to go sell to customers. But the reality is that you're selling all day in, a, in different settings. You're selling when you meet a potential candidate who you want to recruit. You're selling when you meet an investor who you want to invest in the company. Uh, so you're, you're always selling, right? Uh, even when you're not in front of a customer or p- potential customer. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I think that is one skill that uh, probably everyone can improve. I know I can improve uh, a, a great amount there, um, but it's just that's the one that I think is, is super common across many careers and in particular VC and, and being a startup founder. Yeah, for sure. Um, I like completely agree with you because every single day, think about like the top deals. You have to sell yourself to that founder, and then if you have a boss, like right now you're a partner. So I was an associate. You essentially have to sell within your company, like mm-hmm. within your fund. Basically, every day. And you're that doesn't company. stop. That doesn't stop at any level, right? Yeah. Because even at senior levels, you're always working in a team, and so you're always selling internally as well. A hundred percent. When you join General Catalyst, you sort of helped the firm build their West Coast office. At that point, assuming you didn't have the track record as it is today, you had to pitch yourself to all the top founders to get the best deals. At that point, what were some actions you took to build a brand for yourself? When I joined, so when I joined General Catalyst, initially I was based in Boston. And then in 2009, the firm made the decision to start a West Coast office. So that's when I moved. I was the first one to move out and kind of help with that effort. And then a few more people moved kind of six to 12 months after. Um, And so it was a very small team for the first year or two. Uh, I think what I realized then I probably could not have put it into words then, but what I realized in hindsight is just the compounding effect of the daily interactions and meetings that you have with entrepreneurs and VCs. And so what I mean by that is when I moved out to Silicon Valley in 2009, there wasn't a grand strategy of how we were going to build the footprint on the West Coast. I think we had ideas and thoughts and you know, uh, investment opportunities that we were going to pursue. But what I realized in hindsight is how much came from just being in market and meeting uh, entrepreneurs consistently and constantly meeting founders and having good interactions with those founders, right? Because Mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, founders will remember the really shitty interactions and they'll never come to you again. And so you don't want to be in that bucket. Um, but they'll also remember the good interactions, right? And so the, uh, and, and this wasn't an intentional strategy, but I think in hindsight, what I realized is that by being really founder centric, uh, when we would meet founders, they would have, I think, a good interaction. And that then a year from now, two years for, you know, later, when they talk to a friend of theirs who's raising capital, they might refer them to general catalyst, right? And so mm-hmm. I think, and I see that now in, in um, at M13, who are obviously still uh, building our brand and still very, very early into what this firm could evolve into. And so I see this all the time, which is you meet a founder, you know, I, I've been with the firm for two years now, meet a founder, uh, I met a founder two years ago, and, you know, they're sending me, you know, companies and friend, friends of theirs that are raising capital. And I just think that that compounds over time. So you have to be patient uh, and you've got to view every interaction as an opportunity to build the brand. Uh, and and um, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Venture is such a network based business. Even you may not end up investing in a company if you still need to constantly deliver value to people. I feel like most times it's not necessarily hard to get deal flow, but it's hard to get the quality ones. Is there anything that in particular you would do to curate a high quality network that strategically attract the smartest people? Well, I think, 
a couple thoughts on this. One is I've always felt like the way there's no right way to do venture. So I want to be clear on that. Um, but the way that works well for me is to have a very wide top of funnel, meaning that I want to see everything in the market. I'll take a lot of first meetings, but then a pretty narrow, uh, middle middle of the funnel right which mm -hmm. to me means basically you take a lot of first meetings but uh, maybe a lot of those don't uh, move to the next step uh, so so that's first thought is just really being open-minded and and being willing to talk to founders even if you maybe think that it might not be the right fit or um, you know, maybe it's not coming from, uh, the introduction didn't come from someone that, you know, really well. I mean, mm -hmm. I just try not to really think about those things as much and just kind of, uh, be pretty open-minded from that perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. the second is, I think as you start to develop relationships with, uh, CEOs and other investors, uh, you naturally gravitate, I think, towards people that, you know, you'd work well with. And this is, such a long-term business that mm -hmm. that is such an important consideration, right? So if you're going to be on the board of a company along with another investor, it would be great if you got along well with that investor, mm -hmm. right? Because it might be a seven to 10 year journey. And so I do think naturally you kind of gravitate towards the people that uh, you enjoy working with and that you feel like you can have a productive relationship with. And that could also be CEOs who maybe are investing their personal capital or being asked to serve on boards, that sort of thing. Uh, and then I think the third uh, idea or thought that I would point out is being open to uh, new companies, channels, geographies that maybe are not in your existing network. And so I think that comes to, you know, for example, we think Atlanta is a super interesting um, ecosystem today. Uh, so we're spending some time trying to develop relationships with incubators and smaller funds in Atlanta. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are not folks that are in our network today. And so being, I think, intentional about trying to grow and expand your footprint uh, and, and also uh, as I mentioned, this is a sales job, so you can't be afraid, I think, of, of just uh, trying to get a founder on the phone. Uh, maybe you read an article about them or whatever it might be. So I think those are kind of the three thoughts I'd, I'd have on, um, you know, kind of quality, quality versus quantity around deal flow. For sure. Um, why Atlanta? <laughs> is that where people yeah. will be moving? After a lot that? of people, yeah, a lot of people are moving to Atlanta there's a great uh, infrastructure around schools uh, and particularly engineers. Uh, and I just think it's one of these places culturally, especially for consumer um, culture and, you know, sort of connection to uh, what's happening in the world uh, is, is much more prevalent in a place like Atlanta than it is in many ways than, than it is in Silicon Valley, right? Um, there's a lot more sense of American culture in a place like Atlanta than, than in Silicon Valley, so. Yeah, that's super interesting. I feel like a lot of people just moved out of the Bay Area. Speaking of trends, people are moving and many people becoming solo GPs and shifting the investment focus outside of Silicon Valley. What do you see as the next wave of venture? I think we're gonna continue to see solo capitalists and and i just think private investing private equity uh is being democratized and so whether it's through marketplaces like angel list and you know the crowdfunding ones republic etc uh i or or just direct investing i do think uh, this world is becoming more uh accessible and I also think, you know, the thing that probably we haven't fully grasped what the impact is going to be is having a robust secondary market for uh, private stock. Uh, I think that that could have some real implications uh, for the future of venture capital because, um, you know, you could potentially have multiple owners of a given share of a given company 
over the life of that company, right? And today, I think it, it's like there's a bifurcation of your private company or your publicly traded stock. And there's a huge bifurcation. And basically, you know, those two worlds don't really um, interact or intersect all that much. Uh, and I think that we just have not grasped what happens when things like Carta X become ubiquitous and where you can trade private stock. Do you effectively, um, do those companies look like a publicly traded company and people are buying in and out of stock, um, you know, kind of whenever they want? I, you know, I don't know um, what, what's going to happen there, but I think there's some really interesting changes on the horizon. For sure. Also curious about like, what's your thought on the NFT? Yeah. Like NFT. curious, like, yeah, do you follow that at all? Yeah, I, I think I follow it a little bit. Definitely wouldn't call myself an expert. Um, I, I think what's interesting about NFT is that the world, the, the internet uh, has made it very easy to reach people, very hard to monetize, right? If you think about your typical creator. Um, and so, and, and the channels for distribution are not the same channels for monetization. And so I do think that what NFTs have allowed is much like a, a, a very clear path towards monetization um, mm -hmm. that in theory could be much better and more efficient for the creator, right? Because in theory, uh, there's not the marketplace tax, um, you know, that you might pay when you're dealing with an NFT, right? Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, the uh, being able to do these things anonymously. And I, I mean, there's, there's, some, there's some components that I think are pretty interesting that should improve monetization and the ability to monetize. I, the one watch out in my view is, I think the New York Times uh, had an article a few months ago that 20, in 2020, it was basically a surplus of $1.5 trillion uh, in American consumer sort of uh, cash flow. Mm -hmm. um, and that came from, you know, I think it was $500 billion of stimulus mm -hmm. and then a billion. So basically money coming in to uh, people's bank accounts and then a trillion dollars of reduction in spending. Um, and, you know, think about travel you know, even simple things like haircuts, right? I'm sure like the haircut industry is way down, right? In 2020. So um, if you think about that, there's $1.5 trillion of cash um, that's kind of sitting around and I'm sure a lot of it's gone towards the market. Some of it is sitting in, you know, bank accounts as checking and savings balance. Um, but, but, you know, I do think some of it is finding its way into NFTs and, because of the size of the market at this point, it doesn't take much to see the kind of valuations of um, NFT, you know, goods that we're seeing. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that's the only watch out is basically there's a lot of cash in the system right now. And so um, is it as sustainable? I think the trend is super sustainable, but mm -hmm. Are today's prices sustainable? I don't know. You invested in the Honest Company, which is pretty much the OG influencer consumer brand. You were the trendsetter there. Since then, all the celebrities and influencers have their own CPG brand. Where do you see that trend going? Yeah, I think the way that I look at it is everyone is a creator. And so the internet is enabling people to monetize all of their talents and skills. Uh, there's some potential downside to that, which is that uh, you're competing more on a global scale. And so, you know, wages and things like that. And we've seen this all now with Uber and Lyft. Uh, the discussion around wages, I think, is even more important today than it's been in the past. Um, but regardless, I think the internet is making it possible for everyone to earn a living through what they like to do and what they're good at doing. Uh, and so I do think that there's going to be many things that are kind of micro in size. There'll be a lot of micro influencers that run very successful kind of businesses, maybe as a side hustle, maybe as a main thing, who knows. Um, but there will be, you know, the folks that turn their very large following into uh, businesses that 
sustain and endure. And, and I think we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of that. I think the rules though of value proposition and product market fit still apply. So I don't think that just because you have a big following uh, that creates a great outcome. I mean, look at the delta in market cap between Spotify and Tidal, right? Tidal just sold. Um, but, you know, I, I haven't checked Spotify's market cap in a little while, but, you know, probably 100x Delta, right? Maybe a little um, closer to maybe 140, 150x. Um, so, but, you know, Tidal had the benefit of Jay-Z. Huge following. Spotify didn't have that benefit, um, but it didn't matter because Spotify's value prop was so much stronger, right? And the, mm -hmm. the quality of the execution was stronger. Yeah, I think I've heard it from somewhere Justin Bieber invested in Spotify. Don't know if it's true. Anyway, I think, of course, there's a lot of benefit to invest in celebrity founded brands. They have organic traffic, but I feel like there might be some challenges for the brand to grow out of the celebrity unless you're the Kardashians. It's probably hard to create product in different categories. For example, Michael Jordan's current brand is sporting goods, clothes, and shoes. And one day he decided to start a snack brand. It's probably hard to shift the images in people's head about him and his personal brand. When it comes to investing, do you see celebrities' brand have longevity issues? Do you see their brand has limitations? Or do you think this is something capital can fix? I think that certain categories will be size limited uh but i don't think uh and i i don't think capital fixes that maybe it fixes that from the standpoint of being able to expand into multiple product lines and expand into new categories not every business should be a billion dollars of revenue or a billion dollar valuation uh so i do think it's also a little bit of what where you how you think about success, right? And I do think that there are categories of products that um, won't support a billion dollar business, but might support a 50 million or even a $10 million mm -hmm. business. And that might still be a great business for the founders. Um, maybe it doesn't, it's not financed through venture capital, mm -hmm. uh, but that's also why I think things like ClearBank have become so popular, ClearBank and Assembled Brands and all of these uh, folks, because I think there's an understanding that, the venture model is really good at one thing, but you know that one thing is pretty narrow. For sure. Speaking of starting a brand, you started Naturebox after eight years working in venture. I feel like most people love being in VC. What gives you the courage to leave the awesome job and starting a company on your own? So for me, I had been in, I was at a place at General Catalyst in my career where uh, I could kind of commit and to spending the rest of my career, you mm -hmm. know, kind of in venture or, you know, I was 25 uh, at the time, I was sort of young enough to take a, a lot of risk and kind of just see where it, it would go. And if I enjoyed operating, then I could spend the rest of my career operating. If I didn't enjoy operating, I could go back to venture. And so that's kind of the way that I thought about making the move. Um, but there were three things that kind of lined up uh, that enabled me to uh, have the conviction to, to leave and start NatureBox. The first was that I had an idea that I was really passionate about. Uh, you know, the idea behind NatureBox was inspired by my own personal journey with weight loss. And so I felt very passionate about being able to try to change the American diet and change the way people were eating. The second is uh, I had a co-founder that I wanted to be in business with, and he and I have been, had been talking about ideas for many years, and just the timing for both of us was starting to really line up, so that was great. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the third was kind of what I had mentioned around, I felt like I was at a time in my career where I could take the risk and where uh, I had the optionality uh, mm -hmm. to go try something, and if it didn't work, you know, I could always kind of recover from it. And so that was kind of the way that, that I made the decision. And, and just I felt like lucky that those three things lined up. Absolutely. What do you wish you knew as a VC after you started NatureBox? And what do you wish you knew as an entrepreneur after you went back to work in investing? So I'll start on the VC one, which is I, uh, I wish I knew how much execution mattered. Because I think often when you're a VC and you're looking at businesses, 
uh, you're focused on maybe some of the metrics around engagement or customer acquisition, or you're focused on the team and the size of the opportunity, but you're not getting a great view into the quality of the team's execution. Mm -hmm. And so what I think I learned was just how much that matters and how much good execution um, can be the difference between a, a great outcome uh, or, you know, a very mediocre outcome, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I just go back to like something like a title versus Spotify. Like it's just, um, can't, you can't argue the quality of the execution, you know, and, and just, um, so, so I think that's one. Um, and then on the entrepreneur side, uh, probably the thing that I didn't expect was how much of the job was people management. And mm -hmm. as you scale into being a big company, uh, it, just inevitable if you're the CEO mm -hmm. that you're going to be spending a good amount of your time on people management and just kind of internal people issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you just have to be prepared for that. Yeah, that's so well said. We chatted about this before our recording. So much about startups is execution. But on the other hand, so many investors are really focusing on the market. In China, there was a saying that basically, uh, if you're doing something that's on trend, even pigs can fly. If you pick the right market, Kid, even your execution is terrible you can still win yeah. which sometimes is true right but i do think that um the quality of execution makes such a big difference as a vc how do you even tell the person's execution skill because based on the track record it hit or miss i don't know <laughs> yeah it's tough i mean i think the things i would look for are what's changing between your first meeting and the second meeting in the business right mm -hmm. uh i think i would also look to just understand how the company manages their internal goals and how they um, like what their operating cadence looks like because uh, that can give you a lot of signal to what's the quality of the execution right if they're on top of goal setting and on top of just driving internal communications and alignment um, that matters a lot because there's a lot there are tons of startups who everyone's on the same boat but rowing in different directions, you know, and, and that's just not, you're not going to get anywhere. Right. So um, I think that's a, that's a big part of it. A hundred percent. Like you said, the whole team is supposed to be aware of where the company is going. As a VC, how would you judge the progress of the company? Because I can set a low goal so I can hit a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of that, that's, Tough. I mean, a lot of it, I think, comes down to alignment with the founder about what the goals need to be to uh, hit the next milestone, raise the next round of capital. Uh, and, and I do think you, you're right. I, I, a lot. Of, I think VCs probably would be quite split in. Do you want a company to have maybe more achievable milestones, but hit their milestones every time? Or do you want the company that always swings for the fences and maybe they, they miss, you know, once in a while. And I think a lot of people actually would rather have the, the latter bucket, right. Of like, I'd rather have the entrepreneur that swings for the fences and misses their plan versus the entrepreneur who always makes their plan, but the plan isn't that ambitious. Right. I know you wrote an article, talked about raising capital from C to Series A. You mentioned as a founder, you need to spend six to 12 months networking with VCs. In terms of reaching out to the VCs, one type is an investor who primarily invests in your sector, so they may also invest in all your competitors. Another type is VCs who invest in every sector. What would be your approach to those two different type of investors when you pitch? And how do you schedule your meetings to make sure in the end you have someone to invest in your company? I know you probably never had to face these kind of problems. No, 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 no. I, I, I was always, uh, those fundraising uh, journeys were always really tough. Uh, I think the main thing I would say is you have to treat it like a process. And so uh, in advance of pitching, I think you want to have everything laid out. Your not only your deck, your data room. Uh, you want to have your investor list, and then I think when you start taking meetings, the ideal thing is you take. Um, I think you structure it in waves, so you have like a first wave, um, uh, ten to fifteen investors that you talk to, 
Um, and you want to keep everyone moving at the same pace, right? So ideally you struck, you set up those meetings for the same, you know, within a few days of each other. And you just kind of go through as many meetings as you can, keeping everyone at the same stage. Um, because the ideal outcome is you get to a place where if you're going to have multiple options, you have those options at the same time so that you can actually make a decision uh, against multiple options. Um, yeah, so, so that's kind of a, the advice that I would give. When it comes to following up with VCs, I feel like everyone is sending these newsletters. Essentially, they give you a recap on what they've accomplished each month. Is this the best way to follow up with the investors? I think the ideal thing is you want to get to a place where you have you, the company is seeing true inflection and you're really building momentum and then let the VCs kind of under the hood. Uh, and I'm using VCs plural because I think the risk of letting one VC, you know, uh, kind of talking to one VC is maybe they're going to say, Hey, why don't we do something preemptively? And then you're not ready to run your process. Right. So, you know, um, that, that's why I think there's a real risk of, of kind of, single threading the financing discussion, right? Because uh, you could end up with, if that VC doesn't give you an offer, then, you know, you're a couple months behind on, on actually running a process. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I don't know that I, I would not encourage the update emails, frankly. I, I think it's more about building the momentum and then uh, giving people an update when you know, uh, that update is in your favor. Yeah, that's good to know. All my founder friends says I need to write an email newsletter, which literally is what I was planning on doing. Speaking of the initial stage of starting your company, you test out the idea of Nature Box by running ads, see if people will sign up. You guys successfully tested the idea over a commercial. How much did you have to spend on that ad and what kind of momentum should you have to make sure it's worth invest your time in an idea? Well, I mean, I think it's different for everyone uh, and every business here. We felt like if we could get 100 people to sign up for NatureBox um, before we ever had a product, I mean, just doing website testing, then that was that was good enough. And that was success in our eyes. I think it's different for every kind of product. I mean, for me, um, when you have people take out their wallets and actually spend money on something, that's pretty big signal because think about the number of ads that we all get bombarded with all day. And, uh, you know, the number of things that were, uh, you know, always being, uh, marketed to. So if you can get someone to actually take out their wallet and buy something to me, that's like a big deal. Um, but you know, I think for every business it's a little different, right? If you're running a website, a media company, um, you know, maybe it's not about purchases. Maybe it's, you know, uh, getting a certain number of people to sign up for your email list. I, I, you know, I think it could just be different for every business. Um, but I, I would encourage entrepreneurs to just start, you know, like even if the product, um, if you've got to put, put something together that doesn't look great, you know, but it just, you know, it's working, but, you know, isn't what you necessarily envision as success, just get started. Great advice. We're at the last part of our interview, which is a one minute fire on. First question, what's your favorite book? So, um, you know, probably the, the book that I feel like taught me a lot, both about investing and being a CEO was this uh, book called The Outsiders, um, which is uh, kind of about capital allocation. And it's a very business oriented thing, but um, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, yeah. Who made the biggest impact in your career? Probably Isaac Cato, uh, because when he hired me as an intern at General Catalyst, he totally changed the trajectory of my career. Who would you invite to your dinner party? Uh, like celebrity, like famous person or? Uh, whatever, it's anyone. your party. <laughs> anyone. Uh, you know, I, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, look, I think Elon Musk uh, would probably make a very fun uh, dinner party uh, guest uh, anywhere. So, uh, Where can we find you outside of work? Twitter, although I'm not as active right now. And then I do blog uh, every once in a while. Um, so Twitter is at G Ramblings and uh, my blog is just GothamG.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I read your blog. I, I love your blog. Okay, oh, thank, Autumn, you. thank you so much for coming on to the show today. Of course.
My pleasure. Great to see you. All right, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Smart Venture Podcast. If you like it, please leave us a quick review and hit subscribe so you don't miss any tips from the experts. If you want to receive our updates, please leave your email at smartventurepod.com. If you want to connect with me, all my socials are Grace Gong GG. Beside LinkedIn, it's just Grace Gong. I'd love to connect with you and let me know your thoughts about the show. Now you can also listen to Smart Venture Podcast on YouTube. Go to smartventurepod.com. Click the YouTube link on the top banner. Don't forget to hit subscribe and smash the like button. See you next time.